Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street from A Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from A Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He's editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. Thank you for joining us again, Dr. Mark Faber. My pleasure. Thank you. The first question I wanted to ask was about uh, interest rates. Uh, for the past, I would say, since the beginning of 2013, uh, the Fed kept telling us about a recovery that was happening. Yet it seems like they don't want to raise interest rates because they know uh, some of these uh, bubbles in the stock or bond market uh, might pop. That's why I think they're probably using patience. Do you think the Fed's trapped with uh, interest rates? Well, basically, there are several factors at play at the present time. First of all, uh, recent economic indicators have been rather weak and not indicating a strong recovery. Uh, most indicators have been somewhat disappointing. Number two, uh, international events um, like what is happening in Ukraine and in Greece and so forth certainly has a, an, a weight on the action of the Federal Reserve. And thirdly, I believe the Fed is nowadays guided by markets. Uh, they are afraid to raise rates because they're afraid that it would uh, essentially have a negative impact on bonds and stocks. So if you ask me, I don't think there will be a Fed fund increase this year. I think they'll keep it at zero. And recent history suggests that uh, this is likely to be the case because since 2009, we had an essentially zero Fed fund rate. Yeah, Mark, Mark I, I, I personally think they're trapped. Um, uh, we know that Ben Bernanke... When he started this after, um, you know, everything crashed in 2008, he said he didn't want to uh, be like Japan. But it seems to me that, you know, they're, they're, uh, the U.S., the Federal Reserve, is going down a similar path to Japan, where the debt just keeps growing, even when Obama says, you know, the economy is improving and that the debt really didn't go down. The United States debt still grew. And if the interest rates started to go back up, you know, we started to normalize um, interest rates, the U.S. probably couldn't afford them. It would take up too much of tax revenues. So I, I think we're in an environment here, you know, with financial repression where um, Japan, Europe, the United States, they, their debt, they just can't deal with the principle of the debt, and they're worried about being able to pay the interest payments on the debt. And I, I think they're going to be managing the interest rates lower, unfortunately, and they're going to be attacking, you know, all ranges of the um, of the curve there, of the interest rate curve, to try to manage that so they can keep, you know, the game going and keep paying off the interest payments with as low a payment as possible. Well, it's not only the U.S. 90% of central banks in the world, in the developed countries, have either zero interest rates or negative interest rates. And, uh, I mean, we are in a very bizarre environment, and uh, nobody knows what the end game will be, but I can't imagine that it will be a happy ending. That I just can't imagine, that some professors and academics uh, running the global financial system will lead us to prosperity is, is ridiculous to think. Yeah, I mean, um, financial repression, Mark, doesn't normally end uh, in, in a happy way. Now, I know the United States, after World War II, um, there was a lot of pent-up demand. The U.S. The US had the only um, manufacturing left in the world because everything else was bombed out in uh, Europe, in Germany, in Japan. So the U.S. did run financial repression, I think, after World War II. But those, I would say, are special circumstances and do not apply to this case where you know Japan is using financial repression, Europe is using financial repression, and the United States. So I think this is definitely, I agree with you, it's, it's not going to end well. Um, a best case scenario, uh, when I look at things, I see kind of you know Japan as a best case scenario for the United States, and that's not a, uh, not a good scenario in my opinion. Well, in Japan, I have to say the following. At least the Japanese 
have significant accumulated savings, which is not the case in the United States. And the Japanese society is a very harmonious society. Uh, the country has many headwinds, including demographic headwinds. The population is shrinking at the present time, so it's very difficult to get any growth if your population is shrinking. But say they live in prosperity and harmony. Uh, I think in the U.S. the situation is quite different in the sense that approximately 50% of the people have no savings at all. And uh, the unemployment statistics, they are looking better in the sense that unemployment has come down. But what has happened is a lot of jobs that were created are part-time jobs and jobs that are low-paying jobs. They're not high-paying jobs. And so I don't believe that the economy is strong at all. The yeah, stock market I, I, has been strong, but not the economy. Yeah, I, I completely agree. There's a huge divergence there. The asset prices, you know, the bond market, the stock market, the real estate market here in the United States, at least in most major cities, is doing pretty well right now still. But the real economy, like you said, is not. You know, we have the Gallup CEO come out and, um, you know, he's, uh, the alternative media has been talking about the low labor participation rate and the fact that, you know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics counts a part-time job as a full-time job for years now. But to hear a mainstream CEO like the Gallup CEO write a large piece with it controversial and then go on CNBC and talking about, you know, if he challenges the government's numbers, he doesn't want to uh, – he's worried about disappearing in the night, you know, getting kidnapped or something. Yes, um, I can believe I, that. I think he's a very courageous person. I mean, I can say these things because I don't live in the U.S., although I'm harassed from time to time by immigration officers, but maybe for no, not that reason. But I think the CEO, uh, Clifton, is very courageous, and at least it's, for once, someone who speaks the truth. Yeah, I definitely see that. And not only that, uh, I just wrote an article and 75% of the jobs created in 2013 were part-time jobs. And not only that, it's estimated that two-thirds of Americans are now living paycheck to paycheck. So if you look down in the numbers and the labor participation rate at all-time lows, it doesn't look healthy. And, uh, not at all. Uh, yeah, and, and the, the government on the jobs report, uh, they, I think they drastically undercounted the amount of oil jobs that are going to be lost, um, full-time, high-paying ones. And that pretty much since 2008, that was almost all the full-time jobs, the high-paying full-time jobs that were created were because of the shale boom, which has uh, turned into a bust now. Yeah, I'll yeah sure. Fish. This is a, an additional problem at the present time that a lot of high-paying jobs were actually oil and oil-related. And there, the employment situation is worsening rapidly. Yeah, Schlumberger actually laid off 9,000. And the BLS counted only 1,900 jobs lost. So if you just look at company <laughs> headlines, the BLS, you, know, you can is tell. A fraudster, is a fraudulent the, institution. Yeah, well, yeah, they lie with statistics. The, the, B, the BLS is BS. <laughs> well, yes, correct. They should leave of, out the L. Just yeah. say BS. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, speaking of uh, central bankers, uh, I know uh, you're from Switzerland, and uh, they shocked a lot of people by depegging from the euro. In fact, a lot of forex <laughs> companies went bankrupt. And then, if you ask me, they shocked people again by initiating their QE. And with negative interest and QE, uh, is it possible if Swiss keeps uh, with this policy of negative interest rates and QE, that they could lose their safe haven status? Like, they were the last uh, country on a gold standard until the late 90s. So what are your thoughts? Well, they never had a pure gold standard, but they had large gold reserves. That is correct. My view is that uh, the safe haven, uh, haven status of Switzerland has long been eroded because Nowadays, uh, the secrecy laws are no longer 
in force, basically, and uh, there are many alternatives. Uh, concerning the Nas Swiss National Bank, I would say it was a mistake uh, to introduce the peg in 2011. And uh, the current, uh, I think, chief of the SND, uh, Mr. Jordan, he continues that peg. First of all, why would you peg your currency against the euro? I don't see any reason at all. Uh, number two, uh, any peg is not desirable in the long run because it, event, because it prevents a central bank from conducting monetary policies. They become hostage to the monetary policy of someone else. That they lifted the peg, I think, is basically the right thing to do. Now that some people lost money because of the lifting of the peg, that's entirely their own fault. Because why would anyone short the Swiss franc? Uh, everybody knew that if the peg is lifted, the Swiss franc would appreciate, not depreciate. So why not short? It was pegged against the euro. If someone is negative on the Swiss franc, he could have shorted the euro with no risk except the market movement of, um, to the extent that the euro would strengthen. But to short the Swiss franc, I really don't understand why someone would have done that. Now, um, Mark, do you, do you think but some all... banks, you know, they are, uh, they think they're super smart and they have economists that advise their clients that also think they're super smart. And so they told them to short the Swiss franc. And then the bank lost uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, equally in a hedge fund. So, I mean, there are certain things I don't understand in the financial market. Now, um, Mark, do you, do you think all these currency pegs will eventually come off? So China's dollar peg, Hong Kong's dollar peg, uh, the last tiny few remaining euro pegs, I think Sweden... Uh, has a euro peg. Do, do you think all these pegs are eventually going to be forced to, to come off in the near future? Well, basically, in Hong Kong, we had a peg since 1983, so it lasted a long time, but it also caused a lot of damage to the economy in the sense that we had very high inflation, and part of the recent demonstrations are essentially for economic reasons, not because of democracy. So we had huge asset inflation in Hong Kong. And I don't know how the end game will be played, whether we will go back to some kind of a gold standard in the world. This would be my impression that this will eventually happen, but uh, not right away, because to return to some kind of a gold standard where gold would have a more important role in the reserves of central banks would be an admission that the professors and the ac academics at central banks have completely failed. But, yeah, that I, will, I... but that will be recognized sooner or later anyway, because the way they conduct their monetary policies can only lead to disaster. Yeah, I agree. We're we're seeing bad theories, and um, you know, Keynesian economics, whether it's r real pure Keynesian economics or not, is is a debate for another time. But we are we are seeing bad theories and um, you know, bad policy from from the academics and the the central bankers who who you know, most of them were academics and had never had a real job in their life. You know, they're just PhDs. We're seeing that stuff fail, and I I think we're starting to see that in the ECB where they violated their mandate, they did quantitative easing. Um, do you think then that um, they're going to keep doing quantitative easing in the ECB, and do you think um, Greece will also leave soon? Well, my sense is that uh, given the weakness in the economy in the U.S. and uh, a weakening Chinese economy and the problems we have in Europe, 
that there will not be any rate increases right away. And in my view, actually, for a very long time, uh, that central banks may eventually... You see, one of the problems the Fed has now is that the dollar has been strong. And so if they increase interest rates, uh, at the time the others don't, it would probably propel the dollar higher, which actually the Fed doesn't want, because a strong dollar is not particularly good for the U.S. economy, and certainly not for corporate profits. In the long run, I advocate always a strong currency. That is the most desirable status you can have. But at the present time, uh, the way the Fed people think, uh, the dollar strength would rather argue that they will not increase interest rates. I was. I actually wanted to switch uh, topic real quick. I know uh, you reside uh, in Asia, and I was just wondering, how's the Asian economy doing right now? Well, my sense, uh, because I have some businesses here, is that uh, it's not a recession, but it's hardly any growth. And there are some sectors in the economy that are weakening. Some asset classes are weakening. Property prices in Singapore have eased in some areas of Singapore meaningfully. Uh, tourism is about flat to slightly down because the uh, arrivals from China throughout the regions are flat to down. And... Uh, we have practically no growth. But it's not a recession in the sense that, uh, you know, you would see a disaster like in 1997, 1998, when we had a real crisis. That is not the case. It's just not uh, growing anymore uh, meaningfully, except, uh, and again, there are some um, voices of caution about the statistics published by India. According to statistics, the Indian economy is doing quite well, which I can believe to some extent, maybe not quite as well as what the statistics would suggest, but it's doing okay. But the other economies, by and large, in my view, are decelerating. Yeah. Well, I was reading for over the past 10 years, you know, there's a lot of growth. Like, uh, for example, uh, China was growing at a rate of somewhere between 8 to 10 percent a year. Uh, wouldn't uh, maybe in this case a recession be healthy? Like sometimes doesn't an economy need a recession just to get rid of uh, bad investment or malinvestment is the Austrian term? Well, my sense is that the Chinese economy... Uh, hold on a second, sorry. My sense is that the Chinese economy is now growing at maximum at 4% per annum. Maximum. And maybe some sectors of the economy are contracting. Because you take, say, Macau, the gambling, gaming center of the world, basically. The gaming revenues are six times larger than Las Vegas. Uh, the Gaming revenues are down in the order of 30% year on year. Now, this may be a specific case, but real estate prices in China have also come down. But you understand, I look at the economy and I look at stock markets. They can move in different directions. The Chinese economy is decelerating. This is now well documented. But the stock market has shot up 50% in the last six months. So you have to distinguish uh, between economic activity and uh, financial markets. 
Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great point, Mark. I, I think the Chinese, you know, the, the, property, the property bubble there, the misallocation of capital, uh, the Chinese citizens are um, money that may have gone into real estate. That money instead seems to be going into the stock market instead of, of China because there doesn't seem to be, like you mentioned, any fundamental justification for these stock prices going higher, and yet they've gone higher. So, um, well, that's just, I mean, you know, the justification is basically that uh, China will ease now, we had this huge rally. I think a consolidation will come. But don't forget that China has underperformed the S&P massively since 2006. And so if you're an international portfolio manager, you see the Philippines, Thailand, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, all up 20% or more last year. And uh, towards the end of the year, you saw China down and flat. Uh, then you take some money off the table in these markets and you stuff it into China. And I mean, I called, I was lucky, I called the China rally very well because I thought the economy is weakening, but it will lead the authorities to ease. And this is precisely what has uh, happened. And as you say, the Chinese were gambling on properties. Once the property market does not perform well anymore, they move to something else. And they go less to Macau, so they gamble on stocks. Yeah, Mark, Mark, um, uh, you could probably answer this better than I could, but from what I've heard, there is a number of Chinese out there that, you know, don't do any fundamental research. You know, they don't look at dividend yield or P.E. ratio, uh, if you can believe, you know, some of these financials of some of these Chinese companies on Chinese exchanges anyway. But I've read articles saying that, you know, they just look at the name of the company, kind of like, you know, picking out a, a horse at the racetrack, and they just gamble on the company just because they like the name or the numbers in the company. So there's, you know, company, Chinese companies on Chinese exchanges that, you know, put 888 in the company because, you know, those are the lucky numbers in, uh, in the Chinese culture are the eight. Well, there are lots of momentum players, but let me remind you that the quants in the U.S. and in Europe are basically also momentum players. So we are in good company. But it is true, there is a lot of... Look, in Asia, we have a lot of liquidity. There's lots of rich people who have... Uh, I mean, the number of billionaires and millionaires has grown faster in Asia than anywhere else in the world in the last 10 years. So people have money, and if something moves, they gamble on it. Yeah, yeah, um, but lo long term, though, Mark, um, you're still more bullish on Asia because there's actual savings there. Um, there's not as many rules and regulations. So you um, you wrote your book about uh, tomorrow, uh, a number of years ago, your best-selling book about um, Asia's prosperity. You're still long-term bullish on Asia, though. To uh, yes, for but their... less so than at the time because at the time was 2001, 2002. And we just emerged from the Asian crisis, and the whole economic development in China really got underway in a major way. But uh, if I look at today, there's nothing that is great value except maybe precious metals and gold shares. Uh, otherwise, you know, everything is relatively expensive. The other day, a coca painting was sold for $300 million. I mean, maybe it's worth $300 million. If you print money, maybe it will be worth one day a billion dollar, like my art uh, gallerist friend. He thinks uh, in the next five years to ten years, the first piece of art will be sold for over a billion U.S. That's is what is happening when you print money. So yeah, all I, I, I want to I, say is in Asia and emerging markets in general, which have underperformed the U.S. grossly since 2010, 2011, I see better value. I don't see yet bargains because uh, the, the markets are all up from the lows in 2009. 
Well, at least there is some value, and if I look at for investments for the next five to ten years, I can believe that here the returns will be higher than on the S&P 500. That I'm quite sure. Yeah, I completely agree. But one agree proviso with you. is that we have peace in the world. Yeah, I completely agree with your point, Mark. That uh, we've just seen enormous asset price inflation, you know, across the board in the U.S. in stocks, bonds, real estate. Uh, we've seen it in diamonds. Uh, the Chinese are have gone on a humongous diamond buying spree. I think some diamonds, Mark, since since 2007 are up, you know, many hundreds of percent. And um, you know, we've seen it in in um, in, in antiques, in fine art, in um, yes, you know, sure. stuff that's kind of yeah, in alternative that's investments. That's where the inflation is. It's not so much in consumer prices, although I can assure your uh, listeners that in 2015 and thereafter, their insurance premiums will go up substantially because the insurance industry depends on investment returns. With zero interest rates, where are the investment returns going to be? Yeah. Yeah, Go ahead. yeah uh, the investment returns, I mean, the, the corporations, if they can borrow such cheap debt, I mean, there's going to be an enormous amount of mergers and acquisition. We're going to see a lot more leveraged buyouts. If they have this cheap of debt, we're going to see a lot of creative financing going forward um, uh, in, in terms of that. And then we're also going to see, you know, a lot of a lot of assets going a lot higher in value than we should. Yeah, but we sure, but you will see it will end in tears. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, all, all fiat currencies end in tears, though, right? So. <laughs> okay, anyway, I will have to leave you shortly. All right. I was going to say, uh, is it, do you have time for one more question? Yes, yeah, sure. All right. I was going to say, you talk about uh, the stock markets being due for a, 50, uh, for a correction, and you also talk about uh, gold miners being the only thing that are cheap. Do you think it's possible? Do you see a potential scenario coming up where the stock market corrects, but the gold equities decouple and rise while the stock market corrects? Yes, it's possible. But uh, I would say it's more likely that if the stock market really gets hit, that gold miners will not perform quite as well as, say, physical gold. But uh, it's conceivable that gold shares go up and uh, the overall, the whole financial market implodes. That is a possibility. And, um, but I'd just... like to say this, and this is not only my view, but the view of some people who I highly respect in uh, the financial sector, uh, the problem may be one day that if gold really works out, that the academics at the central banks will take the gold away from individuals. That is a possibility. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely a possibility, Mark. And, um, you know, that's despite of the fact that uh, there's very strong demand for gold still in Asia. I think China, according to Kuz Jansen and Bullion Star, is buying up basically 100% of the annual uh, gold mining supply. And, um, you know, we've just seen a, a really uh, bad finances from so many of these gold miners. You know, they've been in a horrible bear market for the last three years. Yes. Um, uh, we're, we're at a point here where, you know, if the gold price doesn't st start going back up soon, I think the mines could potentially shut down in the near future, and there could be, you know, supply problems for both gold and silver. Yeah, sure. I mean, there are lots of issues concerning the gold mines. I recommend that individuals hold some gold or silver or platinum or palladium, uh, but not put all their money into precious metal. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Mark. That that's good advice. Um, what I tell our listeners is there's there's two main rules. The rule number one is politicians can do anything they want and change the rules uh, yes. anytime they want. And rule number two is don't go all in on any one you know asset class in any yes. one country or anything right. because of rule number one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, well, Mark. Um, please tell our listeners uh, how they can find your newsletter. 
uh, the website uh, www.gloomboomdoom.com. Um, I just want to thank you again for your time. My I, I enjoyed our Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, Mark. It was nice speaking.